welcome to our Strong Communities Select Committee. Um, do, do I need to read this? Right, okay. Um, I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet or filmed and will be capable of repeated viewing or another use by such third parties. Therefore, by entering the council chamber and using the seating area, you are consenting to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. Item two, apologies for absence, please. We've had apologies from Councillor Murray, Councillor Nuike, and De Councillor Stocker. Um, possibly lateness is for Councillor Yarrow. And have we got any substitute members? No, Chair. Right, so notes of the previous meeting, 5 to 78. Has anyone? We've had nothing come through. Is that all right? Everybody, not everyone was on that meeting, was they? Um, is there any declarations of interest, anybody? Right, okay, let me just do this. Right, sorry, I missed that. I did that back to front. Sorry, everyone, that was my deliberate mistake. Right, item six is the terms of reference and the work programme, which is from pages 79 to 84. Therefore, you, I mean, hopefully you've read um, these and, and know what they are. So that's really just for you noting, unless there's anyone got a, a question about it. Uh, Councillor Whitehouse, I see you've got your little yellow hand up. Yes, um, I can't actually find the page on the on the um, iPad at the moment, but it was item 22, which was about the figures for um, social rent and affordable rent. There's no date for when that's coming to the committee, and I was wondering why. It's a very simple request. I put it forward on behalf of another member. Basically, all that's wanted are the figures for the two types of rent, um, so that uh, we can understand why one rent is is charge for one particular type of housing, another rent for another type of housing, and to give us a chance to ask some questions. I don't understand why. It seems to be, you know, an issue that just doesn't come onto the agenda. Perhaps Deborah could explain. Um, Thank you. I'm not sure who could answer that question. Deborah? Sorry, sorry Chair, I'm, I'm able to answer that question. Right, thank you, Deborah. Uh, so, so, so apologies, Councillor um, Whitehouse. The, the paper I presented um, at overview and scrutiny was what I thought was, was required, um, which was a paper about the difference in the two types of social housing rent. So if that's not required, then I've misunderstood. Um, it, Chairman, can I just come back? Uh, yes, you did say that you would present that in, in written form. You present it verbally but you did say you present it written, so if you could send it written to us all that were there, that would be helpful. Right, the, the, so, sorry Chair, the report has, has been um, written and was provided, so I'm not sure why it wasn't sent okay. out with the minutes, but I can, I can follow that up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Whitehouse, it's going to be attached to the ONS minutes because it was presented verbally there, so Deborah, it has been picked up and it will be printed in the ONS minutes. OK, thank you. And it'll be removed from this work programme as well. Right. OK, we're on to item seven, which is the co-option of an independent member to this committee, and that is Mr Wynne Marshall. So. Yeah, so you've been co-opted on, so you've got to behave yourself now, all right? <laughs> And then we're going on, I think, to item nine first and then back to eight. Is that right, Deborah? Yes, Chair. Um, thank you very, very much. And, and uh, can I just apologise for not being with you in person this evening? I've actually got um, COVID, so, so um, I felt it, wasn't, um, it was best not, not to attend in person. So this report <clears throat> regards the transfer, transfer of services from the Broadway Housing Office. So in 2019, officers reviewed the number of tenants that were visiting the Broadway to see housing staff. 
And the review found that on average, the number of tenants coming into the office was about 13 a week. Sorry. Um, and this was against the backdrop of a restructuring housing, which led to three specialist teams. And it was also um, against the backdrop of us really wanting to change the way we worked um, with residents. And instead of residents coming to us, us working um, a lot closer, particularly with those who were vulnerable and who, who, who needed a more, um, I suppose, personalised service. So what we wanted to do is take our services out to the estates and provide more of a holistic approach. Now, much has changed since 2019, not least we've had um, COVID um, and, and, you know, everything that, that's come with that. And what we, what we did is we carried out another um, review of numbers to the Broadway. Um, and as you can see on page 104, um, it's got the numbers of visits to the Broadway. And on the right-hand side, it's got some of the reasons that, well, the reasons that people came in. We are committed to providing an excellent service to residents and still believe that that service needs to be personalised, um, particularly when dealing with those people who are vulnerable. And we also um, feel that working in a hub approach with others is the best way forward because then when visits do choose to visit us, they can um, get all their issues dealt with at once rather than you know going from sort of place to place so to this end we've done some work um, with the local church and the church have got a shop on um, the Broadway and I've introduced a hub we've had conversations with um, the church and um, have um, worked with the church and they are in agreement that we can move and host our services in their office which will mean we can take um, a hub approach so so there'll be uh, more than one service being offered this also has the benefit of um, realizing rental income for the existing housing office on the broadway which will be in the region of 22,000 <clears throat> £22, pounds a year. Um, and it's just worth noting that this paper is to be taken hand in hand with um, the paper on um, cash payment options, which um, Susan Lewis will be presenting um, after. So, so that sort of gives you an overview uh, of the um, the, the, the paper and the proposals. And what we are asking for today is that members agree the proposed closure of the Broadway Housing Office, but also agree on the reprovision of the service um, at, the, at the, the church's office, which is on the high street. <clears throat> right. Has anybody got anything they want you to ask about it? it to me, it looks quite... a a good thing that it's all coming into the church, which appears to be more local being in the high street. And I'm assuming that an officer will be there on a set day a week, or when will it be, Debbie? Or So, so we, we are working um, with the church because what we want to do is provide services when which, which are relevant. So, for example, um, Rachel Smith is currently in discussions to make sure we've got a presence when the C CAB are there. And we'll be also working with the um, church to, to understand what other services they're going to be bringing in so we can join up and have our services there at the same time. So, yes, there will be an active presence of officers um, in, in that hub. Oh, it sounds quite good. Ian, I believe you wanted to speak. Just a technical point, Chair. <clears throat> not only is the report pack not showing on ModGov, it's not even on the webcast, on the website now. It's just oh. the agenda front, front sheet. So consequently, I have no side of it at all, apart from the paper copy here. Oh. I don't know what you do about that, but if it's not on the... Yeah, the only thing I can do, Councillor, is I could go out and 
and print a copy for you now, but we'd probably have to, um, yeah. Okay, I can only apologise for that. I, I don't know what's happened. I did speak to you earlier about it, so it, it will be reported. Um, David Wixley, was it you wished to speak? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I have to say some of us have learnt to rely on paper and find <laughs> it much more reliable, I'm afraid. But uh, <coughs> my experience with this um, technology is not very good, I have to say. Anyway, leaving that aside, um, I'd like to clarify exactly which church it is and where it is because um, I think it was mentioned at a high street which is some distance from the Broadway. I would imagine uh, probably a lot of people would prefer to have something in the Broadway. So I just that's my first question. I'd like clarification on that and I've got some other questions as well. Deborah, which church? <laughs> Councillor Wixley, the name is escaped me. I really do apologise. I will have to get back to you on that. Right. But um, I know the Restore Church uh, no. had a, an office in, in the Broadway, but can you, have you got any information on the actual location? Because I'm assuming I'm, the Broadway would be much more suitable than Loughton High Street. I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I've actually um, let, I've actually um, Sorry, let me just let me just get you the name of the church. So, would you want to go on to your next question, and then I will um, I will find it. Um, yeah, the, the other thing uh, which sort of slightly bothers me about this, um, there might be religious sensitivities involved. I just wondered if that could affect. Um, or put some people off of, of going there if, if the church has got a presence there as well at the same time. Um, I, I just wonder if any consideration has been given to that. And I, I would imagine in most cases it won't matter, but it could do for some people. Um, I, I, I haven't um, considered, considered that, um, but what, what, what I can tell you is that, that other services that are going in are, are um, very, very much um, support services such as Citizens Advice Bureau. So um, I, I think from, from what I know about the service, it, it's not a religiously based service. It's more like a community based service. And, and um, to, to give you just a little bit of context, um, it, this, this was actually brought to our attention by um, Councillor Murray. Um, so we were originally going to set up a hub at the Broadway and Councillor Murray suggested that we, we go and speak to the church um, because it, 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 you know, it, it was deemed to be wasteful to have two um, organisations running the same services. Can I? I've got some. You like, may. <laughs> oh, you're very generous tonight. So. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing I, I was a bit concerned about um, is reference to uh, sign-ups being carried out at the time of viewing. I mean, I, I don't know much about uh, how the you know, tenancy letting works, but um, that's, I just wonder if people would be under pressure to, to sign something when they're actually viewing the property, rather than having the chance to look at the property, go away and think about it, and then sign at a, a later date. Um, but I, I'm not sure how the, how the current system works. I assume that somebody looks at the property and then perhaps they visit the Broadway office and, and sign the relevant documents later. But it, th th that's just an, another thing <coughs> which occurred to me. I'm, going, I'm just going back to the church issue. Will there be signage to show that it's, it's part church um, running the organisation and it's part of the district council? Um, well, we will be able to negotiate with the church. I, I'm not. <clears throat> the 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 hub isn't actually a district council hub. It will be the church hub, and we'll be, I suppose, if you like, renting a desk um, and an area. Um, so it so it isn't um, a, a facility which is being provided by EFDC. Um, the name of the church is Saint John's the Baptist um, Church. And to answer your query about sign-ups, sign-ups are, um, are already take place in the um, property when a, view in, when a viewing takes place. 
it, it's on the odd occasion that that's not possible that they take place at the Broadway. So it is common practice for them to be um, for, to sign ups to be done in properties. Uh, did you want to yeah, I just wanted to say that the, I know it's St. John the Baptist because I got sent that information, but St. John the Baptist isn't on the high street, is it? N no, it's, it's, it, it's not. It's, it's, it's um, on one of the side roads on, off the hill, isn't it? Which means it isn't that easily accessible. My, un my understanding is that they're renting a shop unit. Where? In the high street in Loughton? Yes, yes. And that the shop, the shop unit will be can, is going to be used as a hub. Okay, but it's not there yet. I, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, because I've not seen anything in like <coughs> Street regarding a hub. Well, I'm sure it'll be there quite soon because it, it's obviously in discussion. Right, uh, I can't see what your name is, Clive. Miss Clive. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, we're told that we could probably rent the existing office and get an income of 22,000 per annum. I wondered what rental we were going to be paying to the church for the, our space in the church hub. I have no idea, Deborah. Um, we haven't we haven't negotiated um, any rental, but it wouldn't be anything like we we can um, we, we we can charge for the unit. Because um, we would be in effect um, just renting a desk a um, couple of days a week. Right. Is that anyone else? Oh, Wynne? Just wanted to follow up. When you did the survey, did you find out where people were travelling from to come <coughs> and use the Broadway office? You know, what distance they were coming? Were they all local? Were they coming some distance? Were they using their own transport? Were they using buses? Um, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. That's that. I haven't got that information. If we did, uh, if we did ask that. Hmm. Right. Now, um, I think. Oh, Janet Whitehouse. Uh, sorry. Ian. I was just wondering, Chairman, if the the hub that um, Deborah's uh, trying to remember is the Restore Community Church. They've had a hub on the Broadway for a very long time. St John the Baptist is a church in Epping. There is another St John's in Loughton, but not St John the Baptist. But um, I don't know if there's a second community hub, but certainly Restore has had one in the Broadway for a very long time. And it does have lots of services. Yeah. So, so, sorry, so if I can respond, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just coming in, um, I'm, I'm just re reading an, a, an email and, and um, it says offices have been in contact with a hub that is operated by the church and has several partners operating from it. The church is looking to join up and work in partnership with other professionals to give a much more joined up service for tenants and residents alike. Right. I can clarify the address if it helps in the minutes. Um, Ian? Yeah. <clears throat> just to clarify things, we're being asked to agree something which we're not sure what the savings are and we don't know how much the new rent is. Is that right? Deborah? So the, sa so the, sa the savings are, um, we're very clear, the savings are, are £22,000 a year. Um, we, we haven't committed to, to any kind of rental income and the church haven't discussed that with us. Um, so what we're actually asking at the moment is we're asking for the um, for, for, we're asking for members to agree that the um, Broadway housing office is closed. And if we look at the numbers of people going into the Broadway office, we can see that it's highly under underutilised. And um, what the report also highlights is that as officers, we want to provide the best service for residents and tenants alike. And if we're holding an office open, which only has, um, I think it's about 40 people a month going in, and, and some of those are as well, in fact, all of those are for services which we could absolutely offer elsewhere, then it isn't value for money um, for, for the council. Firstly, because you've got the income of the 22,000 pounds that we could be getting from elsewhere. And secondly, because it's office of time, which is just spent in, in that office, 
you know, not, 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 not serving our residents, which is what we want them to do. Um, what I could do, if it's helpful, is when we've negotiated um, the whatever the, the payment the church require, we could bring that paper back. However, um, the what what it's worth pointing out is at the moment we're paying for a full unit, you know, 24/7. Whereas when we're going to the hub, it'll be um, you know maybe four sessions a week. Um, and of course, there's the added value that the residents that are that are using that hub will be able to get services from the CAB um, and, and other such services as well. So I assume there will be savings to be made. That's the plan. I can guarantee members there will absolutely be uh, savings to be made. I, I'm very, I can guarantee that to members today. Um, it seems that, oh, what's that come up on there? It seems that the, the hub seems to be getting more popular and it does seem to be working where, you know, two or three things are going on at the same time at a desk. So um, we we'll just have to watch this space, but I'm sure that it will save money. And, and I think with all these things sort of clubbed together, that people will get a benefit from it as well. So... Wynne, you want to speak again? Just one thing. I mean, the office in the Broadway is pretty obvious. It's an Epping Forest office. Now, are people going to be aware that there's a desk in the hub that they can go to? You know, it stands out in the Broadway, so that's a focal point. You know, having a desk in a hub is not a focal point for people to go to. OK, but Chair, if, if, if you allow me to, to answer that. So, so it's all about how we use um, nudge and how we um, use communication with residents. So, so there are many ways we can let residents know um, where, where our services are. And I, if I use the example of the Waltham Abbey um, Leisure Centre, I was there meeting residents a couple of weeks ago and, and they, they have a hub type setting. And um, I walked past there and um, it was positively buzzing. So I think given the right communication and the right information to residents, I have absolutely no doubt that we can make this work. Right. OK. Well, I'm sure it will work because we'll have to make it work. Uh, right then, thank you very much, Deborah. And then if we go on to Sue, Susan Lewis for item eight. Thank you, Chair. Evening, everyone. Okay, One second, so, um, Susan. following on from Deborah's report regarding the proposed um, closure of the Broadway office, um, my paper is to talk you through some alternative proposals for our cash paying customers. So we have 1,000 customers who currently pay by cash. Um, sorry, it's right. Uh, so we've got 1,000 customers that pay by cash. And currently they've got one location and that's the Broadway. And the Broadway office is only open for cash payers on Monday and Tuesday between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So we're quite restricted in terms of when customers can tend to pay by cash. Um, our recommendations as per the report are that we issue our existing council tax and, and NDR cash paying customers who use the Debden cash office with all pay cards. So these cards can be used in face-to-face um, -face in any post office and all pay points such as supermarkets, convenience stores, etc., of which there are 62 in the district. The um, implementation for this option can be done using existing resource and we would be looking at November in terms of time scales. Um, Basically, the residents could go to any of these locations, and I believe we said, um, I think it's Londis, which is the closest one to Devon Broadway. They can attend any of these 62 locations, hand the card over to an assistant, um, and pay by cash or pay by card at any of those options. So clearly there's benefits for, for the customers. Um, as I said, the cash office is only open for four hours twice a week. So there's going to be less travel for residents, which supports sustainable localised services. Instead of travelling to Debden, um, they'll be able to pay six days a week at those 62 locations. 
in terms of um, savings, year one estimated savings of six and a half thousand, ongoing yearly cost of uh, just under three thousand versus thirteen thousand existing cash office, and ten year savings of ninety just over ninety seven and a half thousand. Um, myself and Councillor Line met, so I'm actually we put together some Q and A's as we preempt the questions that we may get asked. So you'll be aware that customers, some residents have got existing all pay cards. Unfortunately, it's not possible for them to have a reference number. So to use one all pay card for services, because they'd have a reference number that they'd need to key in, which leaves, leaves us open to um, user error from manually inputting card numbers. So the only difference is they've got one additional card to cover. Um, this isn't for people on benefits. This is just for anything that our residents will pay for themselves. And in terms of the plan for rollouts, the intention is that we would roll this up to those customers who use debt and cash office, first of all, and then look at options for other cash payers. Um, just one thing to note in terms of any other services which the um, debt and office supports. We do get coins which are collected from public toilets which are counted at Debden, so we need to agree an alternative process for this. And also about 2% of total users, which are sundry debtors, so we need to agree if we continue to accept cash from them. So the recommendation, as I said, is to, um, in line with the closure of the Broadway office, to offer those all paid cards to our cash payers using the current office. Are there any questions? Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't have a speaker on. Thank you, Susan. Um, just one thing which I forgot to do was for us to agree um, the item just before, uh, the, agree the proposed closure of the Broadway. So was everyone in agreement with that? I apologise for that. And then was there anyone wanting to ask anything on... Oh, David Wixley. Yes. Yeah, I, I can't actually agree on, on item nine because I would like to have had more information about it. So I, I think uh, the best I can offer is to say that I abstain on that one if everybody else is in agreement. But uh, <coughs> I would have liked to have known a bit more. I certainly know, like to have known where the, the uh, hub is or is going to be. Um, so I, I think we could have done with more inf information as regards in item nine. Right, you want some more information to you on that, right? Has anyone got anything they wish to ask Susan Lewis? Uh, Ian Hadley? Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say I, the right decision has been made, but the other point is um, I found a very good, clear report to read compared with a lot of them that I get. Straight to the point, no messing about, easily understood, despite being technical. Thanks. Thank you for that feedback. So that praise can go to Rob Purse, my team manager, who is on the call, who uh, wrote the report. So. I've already told him we did a great job with that report, so well done. It's good to see him recognised. Thank you. We like them very plain and simple. <laughs> <laughs> right, but then, oh, David. Yeah, I, I just wonder if Susan could explain to me exactly how an all pay card works, because it's something new to me. And um, I've got some comments about the locations, post office. I, I think there's some, some missing, which would be useful to, to add to the list. Susan. Okay. So in terms of how the all pay card works, um, we would issue the card to the customer. They would take the card to one of the 62 locations and they would either ha hand over the card, which has obviously got their, their details on, along with the cash that they're paying, or they can pay by, um, by credit or debit card. Um, that's it, Rob, isn't it? I don't think there's anything else to add in terms of how it works. That's exactly right, yes. They hand over the card. The, the store or the post office will scan that card, which automatically allocates the money to the correct income, uh, to their correct reference number for their um, council tax account or their housing account. Um, and then they hand over their, their method of payment or, and how much they wish to pay. Yeah, it's too bad. It's too bad. Um, That's exactly Yes, they hand over the card. The, the store or the post office will scan that card, which automatically allocates the money to the correct income, uh, to their correct reference number for their um, council tax account or their housing account. 
um, and then they hand over their, their method of payment or, and how much they wish to pay. Right, yes. In a minute, Rose, uh, Wynn Marshall was before you. Wynne. Yeah, um, when you were doing the survey about how many people paid, can you tell me the age groups of these people who were paying in cash? Was it, was it primarily you know, the more elderly people who were paying cash? And secondly, one of the post offices you missed off is in England's Lane, which obviously is a, another local post office. So which post office was mi missing when? England's Lane. England's Lane. Okay. Because from the list, Rob, these are the ones who've got a pay point, who, who see, um, have got a pay point facility. But we can look into that in terms of that post office as to why that's missing, because if it's all post offices, what's different about that one? All right. Okay. Uh, it might not have the all pay, just near as a post office as all, so you might be correct. Yeah, okay. Well, right. do, you want, do you want to answer about the age groups? I know we did the consultation, which gave us some feedback about users, but I'll, I'll let you sure. answer. Just, just to touch on the, the post offices, first of all, um, all post offices are included, so it's probably just the data we were provided in terms of uh, the post office locations uh, wasn't wasn't complete, but all post offices are included. Um, in terms of the age group, I don't have that data to hand, but um, in general, based upon previous um, research, certainly most of the people that use um, the Debden Cash Office and Pay Cash uh, tend to be of, of an older generation, or you know, people with perhaps with um, with additional needs in terms of. Um, technical understanding and knowledge um, and that want that face-to-face -face support. Or carers. We, we also found it was carers or, or, or those that just didn't have a bank account. Um, yeah, that's it. Right, um, David Wixley. Yeah, I, I was going to add to the um, additional sub-post office. Um, there's one in Loughton Way, which is just inside Bucker Steel, which I think would be useful for council tenants who live at that end of the town and in Bucker Steel. So I don't know if that's on the list, um, but I think it would be a useful addition if, I don't know mm -hmm. if, if you're aware of that one, Susan. And uh, also, well, also the yeah. one in Loughton High Road, of course. As, as Rob was saying, so it's definitely all post offices. So Rob will query why they were missing off of the list. It might be... The, you know, the data entry error, but it is definitely all post offices. Right, um, thank you, Susan. Rose, Rose Brooks, sorry you had to wait. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, members. Um, I, I have been watching the webcast all the way through, but um, just having difficulty. Um, this is, these, the Broadway closure and this uh, are of great interest because they do come together because the Broadway, as many of you know, and the Alston Ward next door are two of the highest uh, um, deprivation wards in the district. And payments by cash go hand in hand with people that haven't much money. Two things concern me. Um, that even though we've only kept it open a few hours a week for a long time, the Broadway office, uh, I've been on the Broadway a lot, particularly the last year, um, and our office has often been shut. For many people, it's still a very positive presence, that council office. And we do have a lot of people who are on payment plans for their rent. And I'm, I, you know, th these are people paying five pounds a week sometimes, very small amounts. And I'm just very keen that things are made easier for them. Um, the, the St. John's have not opened the hub very much at all, not in the last year. Um, and that's one of my concerns about the move to get more rent. I can see it seems logical. And also, I had a tenant who needed to sign a new agreement. Getting to Lyme's Farm is difficult, really. Um, but if you assure me that it is as going to be just as easy for people to pay at the post office, because I find post offices differ greatly in the service and help they offer. Because I don't use that one, very often, I can't comment on the service in that one, but um, I do think that people need a Rolls Royce service, really. Um, and, you know, it's, it just seems to me a bit of a pity 
that um, you know we're closing down a presence in a, a ward of tremendous deprivation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Susan. I think the, the, the thing is, if housing are also coming out of the boardway, um, we can't resource it. You know, we've got two cashiers there. We had an incident there yesterday with a very aggressive customer um, and Deborah's team were on hand to support, but we can't keep an office open with just two cashiers for a, a healthy safety and a risk point of view. It, so it's, not, it's not viable. Um, so post offices, convenience stores, supermarkets, so, um, you know, and there are, I guess it's 62 locations and haven't got to travel so far. Yes. Um, just as a matter of interest in your survey, because I haven't been able to see the papers that uh, the paper people have, um, in terms of people paying cash, was there a greater proportion at this end of the, uh, you know, in the Broadway and Alderson wards than, say, Epping Hemnall, for instance? Well, you want to yeah, well, in, in terms of cash payments, the Broadway is, is one of the only channels we, we have for cash payments. So uh, mm -hmm. there is there is a map which shows we have people travelling yes. right across the district yes. at the moment to Debden in order to pay. Yes. Um, so this would give them more local um, pay, you know, places where they can pay more locally. Um, we do have um, automated payment kiosks, uh, one based at, at Loughton, uh, Wolfmobile Library, and two based at Epping Civic. Um, they're quite busy, but as I say, there are, there's, a, there's a hardcore group of people that really want that face-to-face -face service. So that's one of the things this delivers. Um, just picking up on knowing about the service itself, um, we already have a relationship with All Pay for housing customers. So we do already know that this works and works well for housing customers. Appendix six, um, Rob, is in the report shows the, there's a, a map with the the locations. That's correct. The cash office. Yes. So they are spread out right across the district. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Well, the idea is uh, that we scrutinise these things, so that's what we can do. Keep our eye on it and see how it goes, and. Um, Hopefully, it all works out well. The, the hub, I think, at our leisure centre seems to be buzzing, so I'm sure if it works there, and we've got quite a lot of poor people, um, but I'm sure it will work elsewhere. So can we um, just agree uh, on this so as it goes forward? Um, on, I've lost my page now. On the, the proposed closure of the Broadway, which... And, the, and then we just scrutinise it and keep our eye on it as it goes forward. Is that all right with everybody? I don't think I've missed anybody. Right. Right, then we go on to item 10, which is the sheltered housing refurbishment pro programme, um, which is on your pages 107 to 110. I think that's you, Deborah, again, is it? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, so this um, paper is... Uh, regarding the sheltered housing refurbishment program and following the successful refurbishment of Frank Breton House um, this this paper is uh, is asking for a recommendation that this program of work continues um, and that the sheltered housing schemes are upgraded at a rate of um, two a year. So if I just give you a little bit of, of context. So um, <clears throat> at the um, cabinet meeting on the 21st of June last year, members approved a pilot refurbishment scheme at Frank Breton House. And this was working with an organization called Buckingham Interiors, who are part of the Furniture Resource um, Center, which is an organization um, up in Liverpool, which is, um, a registered social enterprise and charity. So um, the way it works is Buckingham Interiors is the commercial arm of the organization and all their profits go back into Furniture Resource Centre um, and they do various things and, and, and help um, various people. So the um, work consisted of in, internal refurbishment. The, the colour scheme um, was picked 
from a palette of um, different um, uh, mood boards, which were presented to residents. And um, as you can see in the paper on um, uh, page 108, um, we did carry out a survey, which we promised to do. <clears throat> and um, of the, the survey, 20 people uh, returned the, um, the, the survey. Um, of that, 75% um, of, of residents were happy with the quality of the work, um, et cetera. So the way it's funded is um, EFDC get a loan and then um, pay the capital upfront costs and then charge the uh, residents in the form of a service charge. Um, and you can see on page 108 that, um, that in, um, for Frank Breton House, it was £7.77. Um, that gives you a little bit of context. And um, as stated at the beginning, what we're, what we're asking today is that we, we, um, we continue this scheme um, with one or two sheltered schemes to be renovated um, a year. Right. Um, uh, Councillor Holly Whitbread. Thank you, Chairman. And sorry, I'm slightly late this evening. I got a train back from Chelmsford. I was trying to be eco-friendly, but I probably would have been quicker to jump in the car. Um, just if I can just add to Deborah's report, if that's okay. And I hope Deborah's feeling a little bit uh, better this evening. I know she's had. COVID. Um, this is a really important piece of work that we are doing. And I was really pleased to see members of this committee at the, the reopening of Frank Breton House in Onga. And actually, it was a really impressive piece of work. And a huge challenge we've got when it comes to council house regeneration is our sheltered housing piece, because at the moment, there's an under-occupation. It's the only part of our council housing list where we have a supplementary list. So we look from pe for people from outside the area in some circumstances, although I believe the Onga scheme, which has been uh, regenerated, was actually in many uh, cases over-occupied. Um, but the, the focus around this is making sure that people want to downsize into this older person's accommodation. At the moment, um, many kind of family size or larger properties are um, held up because people just don't want to downsize. And actually, we need to make the offer much better when it comes to sheltered accommodation to try and appeal to people to, to want to make that, that move. And obviously, there's a the financial incentive there, which I know this uh, committee has discussed before. Um, but I wanted to, to praise the housing team for the piece of work they've done here. I think it was really impressive, and I'm sure members would agree. There was that awareness of kind of dementia-friendly uh, communities and making sure we appealed to the, the widest um, amount of people on our, on our housing list and who live in those properties. But I think there is a real challenge moving forward in making sure we deliver similar but even more effective schemes. Um, I think the social enterprise concept was fantastic, although I would like to see a more localised version. I know they were, they were based up north, and I'd certainly like to see an Essex-based, preferably Epping Forest-based company doing that work as well. Um, but I just thought I'd add to, to Deborah's report, and I'm happy to take any questions as well if members have them. Thank you, Chairman. Rose, are you waiting to ask? You've still got a yellow hand showing. I, I am waiting to ask, but I'm not a member of the committee. Yeah. Haven't got any committee members, Win. Yeah, I just went to say that I went along to the, you know, the reopening of Frank Breton House, and I was quite pleased with the the work that had been done. I mean, I'd like to see more local um, artwork being displayed, um, maybe by local artists as well, sort of thing. Um, but speaking on behalf of the tenants of uh, the district, I think it's a it's an excellent idea to try and upgrade these properties to try and attract more people into sheltered accommodation. I think it's a bit of a brilliant idea. I agree. Clive, I believe you wish to speak. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, I too had the pleasure of visiting Frank Breton House and I too was very impressed with what had been done there. I thought it was excellent. I talked to several of the residents. They have been very happy about the consultation regarding what was uh, going to be done. There was only one little quibble. They said they wished they'd have known at the start that it was going to cost them a little bit extra. We're not talking about a huge amount of money, as we said, seven, seven pounds a week, something like that. Uh, but 
when we do the next one, perhaps we can just uh, make it clear to the residents that there will be a slight increase. But as I say, overall, they were very happy with what had, uh, what had been done. Right, thank you. Uh, anybody else? I, I must admit, I do agree that our, our housing team and our officers, Deborah and the various officers, all do a very good job. So I'm quite pleased to be on this committee, really, <laughs> with these people. Um, um, Rose, now, um, Rose, you wish to speak. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, yes, I do welcome. I, I'm sorry, I was away, so I couldn't go up to Wonga to look round Frank Breton. But I'm pleased to see the new roof on the spinney, which I have driven past many times. Um, just a couple of concerns, really, is that if you're on pension credit, £7.70 a week, um, dis uh, and you're having to pay this for probably quite a long time, it doesn't sound much, but it does add up. How does it work for a lot of, and for the people that are not on pension credit, but are still on a low income? Um, I, I apologise because I haven't been able to read the papers um, on my ModGov because I just couldn't get them. Right, who can answer that question? Would you, Deborah, would, sorry. Yes, yeah, yes. So, so, so the um, the seven pounds seventy seven is actually added as a service charge. So, if residents are entitled to housing benefit, um, then that's actually paid for for them. So, so it's a, a so it's like an additional um, benefit, if you like. Um, and for residents who who are um, quite quite close to, I, sp I suppose that that line. If it actually takes them over, we can we can support them in making um, an application for benefit to to pay to pay that seven pound seventy seven. Right, thank you, Deborah. Is there anything else, Holly? Everyone? No, no nothing for me. Thank you. Right then, um, the recommendation is that um, we carry on you know, refurbishing these properties. Everyone in agreement? Right, thank you. Right, we're going to item 11, which is the change in landscape of housing. Paper one, pages 111 to 114. Right. Thank, thank you, Chair. So so I apologise in advance that, that the, the, these, these papers on regulation do become quite technical. Um, but the, the decision required is that members just note the change in landscape for housing and property services, and that members note this, which is the first paper on regulation, and there will be further papers um, which will be presented. So 2021 was a, a big year for housing, and there have been several significant changes that apply specifically um, to, to local government. And that will mean that the landscape will look will look uh, very very different, and um, and this is against a really challenging backdrop where demographics are changing. So you know people you know we're we're getting older, and um, the aspirations of our tenants residents are changing as well. And we spoke earlier about the challenges with our older persons housing and having to have a supplementary list that's largely because the aspirations of people are changing and they now want um, a platinum service instead of the gold service we 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 uh, are offering so members can expect a significant increase in in reports and papers being presented um, to to this committee and this paper in particular gives members an overview of the consumer standards. And it is only a very basic overview and the consumer standards go into a lot, um, a lot more detail than, than I've been able to, to put in this paper today. So just to give you um, a little bit of context, housing providers, so we're talking about housing associations now, have always been subject to regulation by the regulator for social housing. But it's only last year that councils, local, local government, became subject to consumer regulations. And we are seeing a worrying trend um, with the consumer regulations and local government. 
because if you go on the social housing uh, regulators website they publish um, judgments um, because they what they do is every four years they come in and do inspections and what is really worrying is that 90, about 90 percent of the judgments for local authorities are poor judgments and poor regulatory um, findings and, and that will potentially lead to um, fines. So, so as local governments, local authorities, we, we, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we can meet the regulatory standards. And on page um, 112, um, you will see um, a statement there which I've taken from the regulatory standards, which talks about the regulator's approach. Um, and it's a, a co-regulatory approach. And what they mean by that is that if, as a housing provider, we know that we're not compliant with the standards, they expect us to self-refer, and then they come in and, and um, carry out their necessary investigations. Um, this, it also means that they expect boards and councillors who govern providers service delivery and are responsible for ensuring the organisation is meeting the standards. So the way we need to do that is more papers and reports on compliance and governance need to be presented to committees so, so you can have oversight and be assured that the work we're doing in housing is compliant. So when the regulator comes and carries out an inspection and questions councillors, councillors are aware of, of you know, what, what, what we're doing in housing and can put their hands, if you like, on papers and reports which um, show we are compliant. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to go over in detail the standards, but they are all there um, in a in a, um, a limited um, li limited form for, for you to, to see, and um, there is a link in the paper which um, will take you to the regulatory um, standards should you wish to read them in more detail. Um, as I said, this is the first of, of um, many papers, and this forms only a small part of the work which housing are currently undertaking. We have other areas of work um, which are listed on page 114, and um, it's also worth pointing out that as well as the consumer regulations which I'm talking about today, we've, all got, we've also got, <coughs> excuse me, the fire, the changes to the fire safety order. We've got the Building Safety Act, and we've also got the um, social housing white paper, the the social housing regulation bill, which is also going to bring um, a number of changes um, for housing providers. Um, and it, it, it's worth saying at this point that that a lot of these changes are around resident involvement, how we not only involve residents, but how we um, actually not, not, not only listen to residents, but how we take on, um, take, take on what residents are saying to us and we apply changes accordingly. And I've had a conversation with Councillor Lyon this week, um, talking to him just very briefly about the work we're doing on a new resident involvement strategy which supports the consumer regulations. I'm probably going to stop there because I could talk all evening about it, and then and um, I'm, I'm sure you don't want me to do that. But I'm happy to take questions or comments. Anybody? Oh my God! Right, uh, Ian Hadley. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, one big question: many papers coming in the future, etc. Compliance. How much is this going to cost us? So at the moment, we don't know how much it's going to cost us. Um, we do know that we're going to need some more support in terms of resident involvement. We're going to need some more support in, in um, the strategy team. 
Um, we've, we've currently undertaken um, a restructuring housing and asset management. We've undertaken that restructure to support the changes um, that are coming in place, that, that sort of are coming in. So in terms of the compliance and the landlord responsibility and um, the regulator, that, that I'm, I'm quite confident we've got, we've got covered. Um, so the answer to your question is I don't know um, because we're not in, we're not yet in a position where we can we can scope that out. But that's that's one of the the um, the, the pieces of work which needs to be undertaken. Uh, Councillor Wixley. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wonder if Deborah can say does this involve leaseholders as well? Uh, I'm, I'm particularly looking at the. First bullet point uh, on page 112, where it says consult with tenants, and I just wonder if that should also include leaseholders. Um, this is specifically about tenants, um, although I am aware that there are some changes afoot for leaseholders. So, so when when you know that when 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 that uh, is clarified, I will bring that as a separate paper. Um, although we, we we do consult with leaseholders as well. And we do take an approach um, on our estate. So if, if I can give you Limes Farm as an example, where we've um, undertaken works um, and where on other estates we're um, implementing our It's More Than Bricks and Mortar program, we don't just then consult with tenants. We consult with the whole community because what we're trying to do is create great places where people want to live. And that involves residents, non-residents, um, and leaseholders. Thank you, Deborah. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've listened to your report quite in detail. Um, my profession is in compliance, so it's of uh, a lot of interest to me. I um, have some questions, and um, forgive my ignorance as a new councillor, on the legal advice that we'll be given as councillors and also of, for you as officers. Um, obviously, when there's a change in leg legislation, it can be um, quite daunting, especially when, as you um, expressed, we're going to be given quite a lot of papers. I just would really like, um, obviously, you seem quite confident and experienced in what you're talking about, but I would just like to be assured that we will get some support as councillors as well. Thank you. So um, we've actually got a, a briefing for um, Cabinet members on... Thursday, um, and, and that will be covering um, building safety and something which is called CDM, uh, which is not new legislation, it's legislation which be, has been in since 2015, um, but we've been doing some work in the council to implement that more appropriately. Um, I can give you assurance that um, myself and my team are, are fully versed with the regulations um, uh, and, and, and what's required. Um, two of my team members and myself are also undertaking um, a level six qualification in building safety. Um, and that covers all areas of compliance and that's with the Chartered Institute of Building. So um, that, that will give us the, the qualifications to underpin the uh, research and training we've already had. Thank you. Now, I believe uh, Rose Brooks. Oh, no, sorry, Rose, I've got to go to a member first. Um, Clive. Thank you, Chairman. It's a, a trivial point, probably, but it's something I didn't understand. What's an IDA? I said we got to take, might have to take part in a mock I, IDA, and I didn't know what that was. Nor do I. Uh, uh, apologies. So an IDA is an in-depth assessment, and this is where the regulators for social housing will come in usually with about 24 hours notice, and they'll want to look at all kinds of compliance records, minutes from meetings, policies, strategies. And it's at that point that they will want to talk to um, myself, my officers, and um, probably Georgina, Andrew, and um, I would think Councillor Holly Whitbread, and um, possibly some other cabinet members as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, right, Ian. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> On the grounds that um, we don't really know what the cost of these is going to be, 
and if it gets a little bit too expensive, is there any method of cutting down the amount that we comply to? Or do we have to comply to everything? Um, we absolutely have to comply. If we don't comply and there's an accident, we're looking at corporate manslaughter. So there's absolutely no getting away from compliance. If we felt as a council that this was having too much of a burden in terms of cost on the HRA, because this is HRA, not general fund, then what we might choose to do is cut back some of the more supporting services that we offer to residents. I, I wouldn't advise that, but we could do that. Compliance um, has to come first. Um, but as, I, as I, I mentioned, as I alluded to earlier, in terms of the compliance side, the new asset management and property structure has been developed to have the right numbers of staff and expertise to meet the requirements in terms of health and safety compliance. So where we are going to need resources is in terms of the resident involvement, um, working with residents and also um, strategy and policy team. Right, Rose Brooks. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say, is some of this to do with the beginning of the fallout from the Grenfell Tower? This is all to do with the fallout from the Grenfell well, Tower. Yes, yes, yeah. and we can, we can expect more. So, so the building safety bill, which at the moment only applies to build in in a in, in the large sense to buildings over 18 meters, although some does apply to buildings over 11 meters, we expect that that will um, that the, the meters will come down. Um, yeah. and, and and for example, at the moment, it talks about high rise residential buildings as being a risk, but there's talk now about um, high risk buildings being buildings like sheltered housing, so where you've got vulnerable people. So we expect the co the compliance will, will you know, be, be significant coming down the line, and so it should be, you know, because at the end of the day, we want our residents to be safe, and as an authority, we need we, we've got the responsibility to do that, and and I, and I personally take that responsibility very seriously. Thank you. Right, thank you, Ian. Uh, Ian, Win. Sorry. <laughs> Right, um, I think I've all told you before, I sit on the Arch Tenants Group um, as Vice Chair now, and we've had lots of meetings with both the Housing Regulator and the Housing Ombudsman, and I can tell the members here present that the, the information we're getting from them is that they are going to be very strict mm. on compliance within councils from now on, and that, you know, councils that aren't performing, they will be coming in and doing hard-hitting investigations. So I think the work that our officers are doing in Epping is uh, e excellent compared to some that have a lot of catching up to do. Thank you, Wynne. Right, so um, the recommendation um, is that we, we note the changes and we'll just have to try and keep up to date with them all and hopefully comply with everything. Is that all right? Right, then we go on to item 12, which is the review of the housing strategy which is pages 115 to 122. And this is Jennifer Gold. So who's doing Jennifer's tonight? Janice. Oh, Janice, of course. Good evening. Um, can I just ask for the um, screen sharing to be released so that I can share my screen for the presentation that I have, please? The host has the... Yeah, I, uh, I've got it as un... Tick. Let's have... You should be able to do it now. I've got a host disabled participant screen sharing. Let me just try this again. I done. Let's see now. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Let's get you onto there. So you should have a beautiful picture of a beautiful house. Is that right? No. <laughs> Let's see. Have you now? No. In a minute, I'm sure. Yes. Yes. You do. <laughs> And have you just got the house you, uh, with a little logo? You haven't got slides at the side and all sorts of bits and pieces like that, no? No. Brilliant. Well, that's fantastic. Okay. Well, good evening. I'm Janice Noose. I'm the Housing Strategy Manager Interim. 
and I'm here to present the paper on the review of the housing strategy for 2022 to 2027 and obtain your recommendations to take to Cabinet in September for approval. The purpose of a housing strategy is to coordinate the direction of travel for housing related services that are provided across several directorates and agencies. A housing strategy for a local authority is no longer a statutory requirement, although increasingly councils are providing them to account for the evolving policy, social policy, which increasingly blurs the lines between government departments and is currently raising the profile of housing, particularly under the levelling up agenda. We first came to scrutiny in September 2021 with the outcome of a stage one consultation on the housing strategy to identify priorities and themes to develop for a more detailed consultation, which uh, stronger communities approved. We completed a comprehensive stage two consultation in June this year. And I hope you've had an opportunity to read the report on the attachment, in particular, the outcome of the consultation at Appendix A. I'll now highlight the key points and answer any questions before seeking your recommendations to approve the publication of the consultation and produce the draft strategy for Cabinet. Okay, so within the consultation, um, the report that I've just been to, we had contributions from 151 um, respondents, which is a really good response. Um, 74 people completed the online survey and 85% of those were completed by residents, which is great. And they, there was a lot of detail in there. We also had a really very successful professional stakeholder workshop and we had over 60, de well, it wasn't over, it was exactly 60 delegates um, that attended from across the sector, um, both specialists that work across services within Epping Forest and um, Essex County, and also local community groups um, and businesses and outside agencies um, that operate, for example, the blue light services. Um, and we spent the morning going into lots of detail um, about what we could and couldn't um, legitimately put into um, the strategy and how far any of this would be workable before we went out to the, a wider consultation. Um, and then we also consulted 17 councillors and community representatives who attended briefings, specific briefings um, on the consultation. So fantastic response. The feedback from the response, and all of that is contained within the report at Appendix A, was there was strong support for the five priorities that we've identified and the majority of the associated proposals. The five priorities are, just if you bear with me, increasing the supply of affordable housing, promoting safety, just, sorry, one second. Increasing the supply of affordable housing, ensuring quality, safety and high standards, which is what Deborah has been speaking about today, promoting health, well-being and independence, facilitating econo economic growth and regeneration and protecting and enhancing the environment. Within the consultation, there was lots of detail that sits underneath those in terms of aims and, ob uh, and objectives. And the majority of the, those proposals were approved or, or supported. We also provided a proposed, proposed vision, and that was only supported in part. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then within the consultation document, there's a list of they're fairly minor modifications taken into account the feedback. Okay, so. Um, outcome and our recommendations are keeping each of the proposed priorities that we've spoken about move out of a proposed priority reference the local plan into garden towns because that's not one of our priorities 
that's part of the context. So we just put that in the main body as, as a context. Amend the vision to include work, safe, thrive and prosper. Um, and incorporate the modifications on page seven of the 17 of the report. The proposed vision that we'd like to have is to work with the local community to provide great places where people want to live, work, thrive and prosper in safe, good quality homes that meet their needs. Next steps after today's um, select committee is to map an in principle draft action plan with the partners that attended the consultation, um, present the a select committee recommendations to cabinet, and then in October, December, launch the housing strategy subject to cabinet approval. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to raise? Councillor Wixley. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've read this both on the, in the original agenda and the, uh, the extra bit in yellow. Um, I think the two things that in terms of priorities which interest me is the priority number three, which is promoting health, well-being and independence, and linking that to priority number five, which is about protecting and enhancing the environment. I, I'm particularly interested that um, and I have been for some time, actually, even before I was a councillor, uh, that people should um, have um, leisure resources on their doorstep. I'm talking about green spaces, which I think is particularly important. And, of course, it's a bit ironic in my case that uh, I represent Fairmead Ward, where um, Jessel Green sits. And, of course, at one point, there was a proposal to build on 75% of that later reduced to 50% and then eventually thrown out by an inspector, which is a great relief to everybody. So my question is, given the value of these green spaces to people's health and well-being, are they going to be future-proofed? And what I'm thinking of in that respect, that uh, some of these uh, green spaces uh, should be protected by fields in trust status. So that's what I would like to see, and I just wonder if the officer uh, hopefully agrees with me and has got any ideas on how to do that. Thank you. Uh, this week, in fact, um, and last week, I've been attending what's Homes England um, summer learning programme that's addressing exactly that, the link between health and wellbeing and the external environment and the requirements that are being um, incorporated into the national planning policy, um, NPF, NPFF. National planning, national planning policy framework to ensure um, with new developments and with regeneration that green spaces are enhanced and protected. And also um, part of Deborah's um, more than bricks and mortar campaign um, includes enhancing the green spaces um, to enable more outside socialising and enjoyment of, of those places and activities for um, all age groups, um, including nice places to sit and flower beds and what have you, but also outside outdoor gyms. There's a massive uh, movement that uh, um, across the sector at the moment to ensure um, developments are beautiful and the um, reduce the use of cars and increase pedestrianized areas walkways that are safe well lit um, people want to walk in so yes is the answer <laughs> okay Clive. thank you <clears throat> um, uh, priority four fuel poverty on page 119 it talks yes. about investing in energy efficient technologies for new build and retrofit dwellings for longer term solutions. Can I take it it means that with the older properties we are looking at improving the insulation? Deborah, would you like to um, respond to that? Yes, so um, at the moment we're currently um, um, working up a proposal with, with Ian, E.ON to get some funding to retrofit our properties and we'll start with a pilot and then we'll bring that to 
um, committee and, and um, hopefully go from there. So the answer is yes, absolutely. We're going to be retro retrofitting um, older properties. Oh, no more hands up. Ian, oh, come on, Ian. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, um, Back to the old question of costs. And the next steps, you say that you're going to produce a full draft strategy, um, the stage two consolation document. Presumably that will include an implementation plan, which will include costs, because later down you say this strategy shall largely be managed within existing and future service budgets, which of course you don't know what they're going to be yet. In fact, nobody does. What, what that means is this, the, the, the whole principle behind this, and the theme runs throughout it, is in fact, lots of the services that housing strategy is responsible for has a massive overlap with the environment and environmental services and um, the responsibilities of um, agencies, support agencies um, like adult social care, children's services, um, and community safety. And in fact, across councils, ac across the country really, there's, there's two ways of looking at it. There's either duplication of work or collaborative work. So people are working together to achieve the same objective and a lot of the statutory responsibilities for example that Deborah was talking about in terms of regulation and improving the services and the satisfaction for um, our council tenants include things like anti-social behavior and um, making the estate it's a safe place to live well actually um, community um, safety also have those responsibilities and duties, but for our residents as a whole. And things like antisocial behaviour policies um, and health and wellbeing activities, social prescribing of non-clinical activities to try and help things like obesity and mental health problems are equally the responsibility of people like the Health and Wellbeing Board um, and um, Essex County Council. And the beauty of this strategy is that most of this is about coordinating, working together with our partners more efficiently. So we achieve the same objectives without have to, having to duplicate costs. Um, and that's why with the exception of what Deborah was speaking about in terms of regulation. So priority number two, the rest of the, the things that are included in this are already one way or another being delivered by different services or have to be delivered by different services moving forward. Does that make sense? Right, I can't believe no hands up. Sorry, I can't hear the response. He, he was happy with the response. Okay, thank you. I'm happy. Um, Councillor Holly Whitbread. Thank you, Chairman. And I won't speak for, for very long, but I just wanted to really say thank you to both Janice and Deborah and the housing team for this work. It's gone through a great deal of, of scrutiny. Um, I actually thought what uh, Janice was saying about partnership working was particularly important. Actually, I was in Canvey Island yesterday morning with the County Council Cabinet discussing our Council House Building Programme and Regeneration Scheme but also where the gaps are in terms of partnership working often and having a, a wider view of what we have on our estates and making sure that we are um, look, talking to our to our partners when we are delivering these schemes from kind of youth, youth centres to also um, the provision of housing required, whether it be for um, older people or adults with learning disabilities. Um, so mainly a, a thank you for me, but I would also like to see, particularly when this comes to Cabinet, and it's not my opportunity to scrutinise it, but more of a focus on that partnership working. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Well, there's obviously a lot going to be coming along on these um, committees. There's an awful lot of changes going to happen. I can see David again wants to speak. <laughs> it's just a question on, on the yellow on page 12. Uh, second bullet point, could um, the officer explain to me what the dwell standard is? 
Sorry, what the? If, if you look on page 12 of the yellow supplement, the second bullet point down, there's reference at the, at the bottom there to dwell standard, D-W-E-L-L. -L. It's okay. an acronym, okay. I just wonder what it stands for. It's a stand, let me just... Let me go back to go to it. I'll give you the full details of the acronym, but it's a standard for um, older people's housing um, that one of our planning colleagues um, that was involved with the consultation um, suggested that we look at incorporating in the absence of as an add-on to, to the standards that we already incorporate. So what I'll do is extend the acronym. I should have put it in there, sorry. Um, and then provide more details after the meeting, if that's okay. Yeah, that, that's fine. I also noticed another one, EPC. Perhaps you could um, let, let me know what that is sometime. Yeah, I will do as well. I'll just have to find that. What page is that on? Is that the same page? Because I'll be able to give you that. Yes, yeah, that's going is on, on the yellow, uh, page 12, um, which referred to a couple of times. It's something to do with a, a rating of A. I don't know if it's... Um... Chair, Chair that's, uh, I can answer that. It's, um, it's the energy performance certificate. It's the... Um, Thank you. It, yeah, it's, it's to, do, to do with how efficient your home is. Energy performance certificate, EPC. Right. Brilliant. All right. Right, well, I think that's almost the close of the meeting. I've just got one very thing to ask about. Um, I've noticed, and I have mentioned it before, Holly, I don't know if you can help or who looks into it, but in Waltham Abbey we've got firehouses and we've actually got three that have been stood empty for ages. Now, I understand it's something to do with the fire brigade, but why are they allowed to be being left empty when there's such a shortage of properties? Uh, thanks for that question, Jeannie. I don't know the answer to it, but I will speak to Roger Hurst because uh, it's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, um, for attending. And thank you to the officers for all their good work and our, our Zoom people. And thank you. Have our recommendations oh. been approved? Oh, yes, sorry. I do. do. Do you all agree and approve the decisions? Recommendations. The recommendations. Right, thank you. Agreed. I apologise. Right, and good night. Thank you.